On today's episode of Locked on Wild, yes, there were some positives that we can pull from this season. We'll take a look at three of the biggest. You're Locked on Wild, your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's happening, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Locked on Wild, your daily Minnesota Wild podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you, as always, for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss out on any new episodes throughout the week. On today's episode of Locked and Wild, a soda pod sized Wednesday as Isha Jerome of the Soda Pod joins us. We're going to take a look at some of the positives we can pull from 2023-2024. We'll talk Kirill Kaprizov. We'll talk the youth. We'll talk the center position here on today's episode, which is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL. For $20 off your first purchase. My name is Seth Topal, your daily Minnesota Wild Insider, credentialed Wild Media member, joined by Isha Jerome of the Soda Pod. A soda pod sized. We're going with Wednesday here today because Isha, it's been a it's been a busy news day uh, here today, to say the least. Mark Andre Fleury re-upping with the wild for another year. If you want a full dive into the implications there, uh, you can check out episode one here today, but I thought as opposed to taking a look at uh, tomorrow's finale against the Seattle Kraken, I thought it'd be great to bring you in here as we start to shift to the off season, because obviously there has been a lot that has gone wrong for the Minnesota wild this season, but there are some things that, uh, that the wilds had go well this season and so uh happy to have you on isha to uh to dive into all of that how are things going today good we're good we're uh full of don cherry's cold effects but we're surviving just trying to uh just trying to battle that's, Bro, that's i've been all sick for a week i don't get it i Bro. don't get it i know your listeners are here to hear about hockey i just don't get it so i don't know if anybody else out there is suffering with allergies or who gets hit with uh everything when the seasons change but if there's any of you out there who are suffering I'm there with you. I'm there with you. We'll get through it. We'll get through we, it. But happy to be back here. Yeah, glad to. Hydrated, uh, glad. ready to go. <laughs> That's all that I also hydrated. And I need some um, positivity right now. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to supply it because obviously I want to start with uh, some of the good as we start to peel back the onion here. That was the 2023-2024 season. Obviously, there was a lot that went wrong. The, we had the Dean Evison era come to an end. We had the start of the John Hines era, a non-playoff season for the Minnesota Wild. But you missed, you missed a big one. Kalen Addison was traded. It, also that. Kalen Addison, uh, Kalen Addison dealt. Uh, Pat Maroon dealt. Brandon Duhame dealt. Connor Dewar dealt. There's a lot. There's yeah, a lot Duhame that happened. Won, Duhame season. stung as well. Addison still, and du, Duhame were the tough ones for me. I still am not used to the... Uh, do hameless intro for the show still still not used to uh to not hearing that so oh, bro, every time i see him in an average jersey I'm, i just want to puke <laughs> but that's just how it goes when things don't go according to plan as you pivot and you start to set your sights on next season now it's not the sole reason that the minnesota wilds did not get off to a good start here this season. Uh, Kirill Kaprizov through the first 19 games of the year, and even beyond that, just did not look himself. And it stemmed from last year's injury, came back to try to be ready for the postseason against the Dallas Stars, just didn't look right. Didn't look right to start the season this year. Uh, Dean Evison made some comments that alluded to the fact that Kaprizov was still fighting through that injury. But Isha, one of the big positives, I think, for this season is the fact that Kirill Kaprizov got himself back on track. And you can really pivot to whatever point you want to 
um, as to kind of when the charge started. It seemed like his play started to pick up a little bit um, after the Sweden trip, just with an opportunity to get some time off. But I'll, I'll give you these numbers. Since November 27th, since John Hines took over, in 55 games, Kirill Kaprizov has 39 goals, 38 assists, 77 points. And even if you want to flip to like January 1st, for instance, he's got 32 goals in 40 games, 29 assists, crazy. 51 points in 40 games. So the first positive to take away, Kirill Kaprizov found it. He found it and then some, and he has been on some kind of a role we like early on in the season we were wondering if he was even going to get to 30 goals yeah no he turned it around quickly and even when he had a little bit of a speed bump with some injuries this year it's like when he came back there was no there was no time to marinate he just came right back didn't didn't need a tune-up or anything so that's what i really love to see from him he's a dog which is awesome right he can fight through adversity and even when he was going through that slump in the beginning of the season, like we saw the frustration. It wasn't like he was complacent. It wasn't like, well, I'm making that big money. Like, you know, I'll get, I'll get my groove back. It was like, no, he still was, he was still trying out there. And I will say this because Hoppy and I talked a lot about this as well. A lot of teams early on in the season, a, I know he wasn't at his best. I'm not trying to make excuses for that, whether he was still banged up or not, but a lot of teams were just like, just, putting two men on him every single game. Like yeah. every team early in the season was like, if you shut down Kaprizov, you have a chance to beat the wild. And literally like in that first 19 game stretch, like there were moments of almost every single game where he had no room to work. And with John Hines, he was able to implement a newer system. And that mixed with Kirill Kaprizov, just getting his groove back and just, elevating his game as he does again this season no team was able to implement that plan on him and with a little bit of a revolving door as far as his line mates this year and then being able to find that you know perfect fit towards the end of the season again it kind of threw some teams off where before then it was like him zuccarello and then you know and maybe hartman or you know yeah. whoever yeah, it was, and you could see, like, you hit it right on the head with the frustration. You could see early on in the year is, you know, he's still dealing with this injury. He didn't know, like, he didn't know what he needed to do to get himself out of it. Well, like, yeah, Nevison didn't change much, much either. He was doing the same thing over and over again, which was just like, man, you got to make some changes here because, yeah. like, it's evident that the team's, like, system is shutting it. Like, their game plan is shutting him down, and he can't get through it by himself right now. Whereas some games, maybe he could just like zigzag, weave, you know, be the superstar, show off his skills out there, actually be able to fend off, you know, two guys who are checking him hard or just outskate the best of them. But yeah, it wasn't going down there. And it wasn't like the co early on in the season, it wasn't like the coach was helping him out much at all. It wasn't really helping out anybody at that point. Yeah, I, I know. And we'll talk about this more because I'm going to do like a dive into some of the best games of the season. But that overtime win against Boston where he scored twice and he scored the overtime winner. I remember thinking in my head at that point, I was like, I think he's back. He's back. Yeah. I think he's, I think he's starting to figure out way. I think he's starting to get it back on track. And I mean, he just has, he has run away and hid to the point that he's even put himself in, albeit it's a extremely long chance. He's put himself in position to have potentially a 100 point season, which if he would do that, and I think he needs five points against Seattle to do it. Yeah. Um, just just an unreal run. Like we're talking one of the best players in the NHL over however long of a span, however long of a span you want to stretch it to. Like as soon as he got his groove back, he just has been he's been on just a a heater even for Kaprizov terms. No, could you imagine if he like put he he could have put up 10, 12 more points in that first 19 game stretch, maybe even more. He he's 100 points plus. And the funny like the funny thing too is let's even, you know, if you just take and I'll just go I'll just go through the Dean Evison era because it's just a nice easy kind of separator point for uh for the season. 
he had six goals and 12 assists. So he had 18 points in 19 games. And so it's not like it was, it's not like it was hideously bad numbers. It just was off for him. And ever since he just has, he, he just went up, just turned into a completely different. Well, he wasn't taking over and care and carrying the team like he yeah. was towards the end where he was like, if Kaprizov didn't score or at least didn't have four to five dangerous opportunities, the team had nothing, right? Yeah, it was for the most part. Like, I'm not taking anything away from Boldy. I'm not taking anything away from, you know, Rossi, who had a great season as well, Eck. But for the most part, it was Eck and Kaprizov's line anyways that was carrying towards the end. Yeah, he's he's the straw. He's the straw that stirs the drink. He's the drink itself. He's the cup that the drink is in. He's the ice. He's the whole the whole beverage for yeah. this uh this And, and the wild they don't have Ryan Reeves to to carry when he's injured like they did last year, so. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, live and learn. Live and learn. We will turn from Karel Kaprizov finding his rhythm to the youngsters as we continue today's episode of Locked and Wilds after this. Today's episode of Locked and Wild is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, the weather is getting nicer and you may be inclined to take some friends to see the Minnesota Twins play this summer. Have you ever had an experience with buying tickets that left you less than satisfied with the overall enjoyment of the day? Game Time is here to help erase some of those same-day ticket buying stresses. They offer last-minute deals plus views from every single seat in the venue. And they don't blind you with any of those hidden fees at checkout. What you see is what you'll pay every time you order tickets. Plus, save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N. NHL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Hey, um, I got another positive. Marco Rossi in his first true full rookie season, not just 19 games, had a tremendous year. And I think it goes under the radar a little bit with just how frustrated fans were and still are with the season. 21 goals, 19 assists, 40 points in 81 games. Obviously, he has one more game. So he'll he'll have he will have played, you know, knock on wood, knock on wood, he's good to go, but seemingly he's good to go for uh for the Kraken on Thursday. Man, that is an amazing true rookie season. 40 points, and he might even get a couple more there. 20 goals, 21 goals. And he's going to be healthy the whole year, 21 years of age with a whole year of his development being put on hold. You know, if anything, taking a step backwards with some of the health issues that he had to face. This is incredible. This is what you want to see from a 21 year old center whose ceiling is through the roof and whose floor now is far from one point in 19 games that we saw last year. Yeah, it is. It is a great tale of perseverance for Marco Rossi in being part of the team in that uh, that first 19 game stint things just really not going well uh in any stretch and part of it was his performance part of it was the fact that he deployment was, too. was deployed on that that fourth line and the third line which were not great spots for him to be but he did what you hope young players do is he took it as a learning experience. He worked on himself. He added some beef to his frame. He put the time in. And like you said, he just took it and he ran with it this season. Uh, if you would have told me, if you'd have told me at the beginning of the season that Marco Rossi would play in all 82 games, would have 20 plus goals, would be a 40 point guy. His faceoff percentage, I do believe, is right around 47%. Which is, I mean, what, what more do you want from a rookie, man? And he would be your primary second-line center. Like, 
throw all of that in, I would have said you're setting the bar way too high. Like let's my honest, my honest predictions for what Rossi was going to do this season. And I could probably even go pull the audio was like 10 to 15 goals. 15 and 15 was my, was my bar was like 30 points, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he just, he exceeded every bit of it. I think the part that's most impressive is the fact that he's going to, again, like you said, knock on wood, the fact that he's going to play in all 82 games. And with the exception of maybe a game or two here, he's been a top six guy the whole season. Yep. Like he has been, he's been getting those opportunities. He has become one of your better net front guys. Like obviously Kirill Erickson like those, those are the guys that kind of lead the charge in the net front department. Rossi's right there behind him. Like he just has, he has turned into this very dependable uh, center. And as we'll talk about here to kind of finish the show, he has helped the wild go from huge question marks down the middle to starting to look like you've maybe got a little something. With Jewel they got a lot of something. With Rossi, like, they got some depth, man. He he is their second line center now. And what's awesome is like Hartman can be used anywhere, but he can be used as a center when needed. But now you have Eck, you have Hartman if you want, right? You have Rossi as either or right now second line, and then you have Kuznadinov on the third. Which again, you could put Hartman there if you wanted as well. So you have three centers, three top centers, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna put. Who's Nadinov in a top center role? Not necessarily because he will be in the top six, but because he will have those Eck like qualities where he can play both sides of the puck. And it's evident. It may, mm-hmm. may not be in X stature, but if he goes on that Mr. September run and maybe stays in Minnesota, works out with him in the summer, or, you know, maybe takes a trip to Sweden and works out with his camp there over the summer, maybe he'll be just as much of a motherfucker out there and a pest <laughs> to some of these teams who just can't stand to play against Eck because he's just. He just probably frustrates them and brings out the inner like insecurities that these players have. Like, oh shit, don't want him to expose this on me. Oh fuck, of course it was X that exposed my one weakness out there, right? And I feel like Kuznadinov is starting to do that with guys as well. So yeah, Ek, Rossi, Kuznadinov as your top three in center is huge, especially when two of them are so freaking young already that like Rossi might be a sixty to seventy or a seventy to eighty point player. In a, in a few years and who's Nadinov will become that 40 to 50 point, maybe even 60 as like on in one of his best years and be a two way guy. So like that is so incredibly positive. Who's Nadinov's he has stamped his ticket onto this team. Unless that of like a fucking Riley height comes in and goes like, nah, bro, I'm the third or second line center, which again, I don't think is going to happen, but they might be four young centers deep by next season, which is unbelievable. The other, like, kind of to, to stick with this youth uh, topic, this this youth area that we just were so excited to see at points throughout the season. Especially the end of the season, now that we got a dose of uh, Ugrin and Wallstad. Uh, excuse me again as well. Um, Brock Faber. Like, no. you, oh. you got you to gotta put him in the positives list, too, this year. We, we got a one little... Best players in the league, and he's on the Wilds. Like he's he's on the Minnesota Wild. He's one of the just like Kaprizov. Like, look through all the negativity, guys. Like, just brush it aside. The Minnesota Wild have two of the best hockey players in the world on the planet. Yeah. In St. Paul, in Kaprizov and Faber. That's like Faber's that good, man. He's one of the best defensemen in the world right now. And like I think the scary part too as we just look at what Faber has done throughout the season. And again, he also is on track to play in all 82 games this season. He needs one assist, and then his numbers are going to look like this. He's got seven goals. He has 39 assists right now. He is playing 24-58 a night as a rookie. Marco Rossi, by the way, 1644. So that's a nice four minute bump for him from uh, his 19 game stint in 22, 23, but Faber like with Brodine and Spurgeon, I mean, Jared Spurgeon played 16 games this season who filled that role. Brock Faber. 
uh, number one power play for most of the year. And I know, I know, um, Declan Chisholm, another name to throw into that mix. Free young pl- player on the back end. App free, yeah. already developed. How are you? Keep the change. No questions asked. And I'm starting. Unreal. I'm, I'm he was starting a to believe the Late fact. Christmas present. It, the, these are just like it, Bill Guerin just just took him, like just took him from Winnipeg. Um, I'm Robbery. starting to I'm starting to believe that Chisholm has commandeered the number one power play, not because Faber wasn't a good fit there, but because Chisholm did well in that spot. No, he's good. But you're still like you're still getting Faber on the power play. You're getting him on the penalty kill. He is part of your number one defensive pairing. He is one of your predominant overtime defensemen. He is one of your top defensemen that gets he's the a leader too, Steph. And he's a leader. We both highlighted because you've gone to a handful of games, the games that I went live to this year, like between shifts during the commercial breaks, like He's talking to his his teammates when there's 10 seconds left on the clock and the Wild are down and out of a game, but there's one more play in the offensive zone. Even Eck looks dejected. Faber's patting him on the back being like, hey, let's at least try to get one more here. You know what I mean? And that is so valuable on top of everything that you just said. Wise, wise beyond his ears. And oh, yeah. like just scratching the surface, like, it is he is already doing so much and you can say the same about Rossi like they're still they're still young enough that they can still add to their repertoire like Bro, imagine he, imagine Rossi who is so good in front of the net right now imagine if he starts to add a little bit of some range to his shot to where he's able to start burying some opportunities from the faceoff circles that range like that's all of a sudden how you become a 25, 30 goal guy. And for Faber, like as he gets more comfortable offensively, stepping up in the rush, stepping up in the zone, yeah. 10 to 15 goal guy. Oh, man. Yeah. Dude, like how I'm, ex- how much I'm excited for Faber right now. It's the same vibes. And I- I'm actually like, covering the wild, right? I could have, if anything, I like, I didn't even like the LA Kings back in the day. Cause it was like Canucks versus the Kings, you know, they were on the rise, but like, he reminds me of a, a drew Dowdy, but already better defensive skills and probably will have better defensive skills than him. Right. But like, that's like the buzz around him because he can yeah. play those hard minutes. He's not necessarily like a, a pest, like personality wise, like drew Dowdy, but there, there's just something there. And, and a lot of it goes because like, he's always on the freaking ice. So that's like the biggest comparable. But, I mean, you'll probably put up less points than him throughout his career. But, man, that, that's the buzz I get around him. And, like, out of – and Drew Doughty played three years and then commanded, you know, his his rookie – or a, a nice contract out of a, a three-year rookie de- deal. But, like, he had the confidence to do so. So that's why I know it's only one, de- one year for Brock Faber. But, like, him and his agent have the confidence to do so as well because, like, like Capriza on the back end, man, like, he did so much – he did so much for this team this year. And I know we glaze him all the time, but we, we just have to because everybody else is just complaining about everything on Twitter. <laughs> Seth and I, we're here for positivity today. And this is what's going to happen. He's going to get a hat trick against the Kraken. Kaprizov is, is going to be like, I don't need any more goals. I'm just going to feed this guy the puck blue line every single moment he's out there because he's out there the whole game. He's going to get one second assist as well. He's going to end up with 10 goals, 50 points, and... No one can say that Bedard will get the Calder after that performance against the Kraken. That's that's my prediction. That's my early prediction. Oh my heavens. That would be hat trick. Okay. One of them is probably on the empty netter. He's gonna get one stinker assist. 50 points, 10 goals. You cannot say that Bedard gets the Calder after that. Wow. Right. I like that call. I'll be roasted in the comments for over <laughs> for being over positive here. Um, big shout out to Declan Chisholm as well for, we'll, yep. we'll throw him in and obviously we're going to, we're going to talk at length about these guys throughout the course of the off season. Well, hey, can I give a deep cut? Who yeah. honestly impressed me this year. 
Uh, Dakota Mermis. Shout out to him, man. He came up, did not have this on his bingo cards probably this year, given that there was some depth on defense that was just completely injured with the Brodeen injury, with the Spurgeon injury. Um, who else? Bogosian was hurt as well back there, right? So like where there was depth suddenly wasn't, wasn't any. And Dakota Mermis came up from the minors and kept his job. Like yeah. the wild, if he played bad, they would have sent him back down and addressed defense at the trade deadline or whatever, right? They would have taken another chance on somebody else being called called uh, called up or uh, waiver wire or whatever. You know, again, glad they got Chisholm, but no, shout, shout out to Dakota Mermis. He was good all year. He was good all year. Is, yeah. he, is he great? Is he spectacular? No. If he's the type of guy that's playing a lot of minutes, is that necessarily a good thing for your team? No, but hey, I got to give the guy, you know, I got to tip my cap and give him his flowers. He he earned his spot this year and he kept it, which is important. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the offseason because other NHL teams saw that film and, you know, if the Wilds bring him back, I'm I'm sure they'll try to, but he probably played his way into an NHL job somewhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which would be great for him. Somebody who, you know, has has spent his time in the uh, in the AHL, has put in that time. He's 29, so he's got a few good years left in him. Yeah, he's he probably has played his way into a full time NHL contract with how he's played this year. So love it, absolutely yeah, positive to too. Um, we will finish today because we obviously have to talk about another key figure for this Minnesota Wild team who uh, has done some incredible work down the middle. And so, as much as we talk about Rossi and who's Nadinov helping solidify the center position. Oh, I thought you were going to talk, you know, the middle of the pipes because the last positive <laughs> I had in my book quickly was Mark Andre Fleury's extension. But anyway, sorry, you're talking about the center position. Yeah, uh, the the I'll, center I'll, I'll... the center position in particular. And so uh, we will finish today's episode of Lockdown Wilds by taking a look at the seas that's on the way after this. Today's episode of Locked on Wild is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up, say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards, make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, and charge other players' rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go on the free App Store or Google Play. Final segment of today's episode of Locked on Wild. Once again, we thank you for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. Seth Topol joins by Isha Jerome of the Soda Pod. Make sure for your second listen, you check out everything that the Soda Pod has to offer uh, from MNCAA, although the college hockey season. I believe you guys had your final kind of roundtable of the year. Yeah, there might be a couple. Of the, I shouldn't say there might be. There's going to be a couple more episodes or a few more episodes that is, uh, you know, sprinkled here around like the draft. And, you know, while there's still some movement in the summer, but the the rotation of the, the three divisions that anyways, the Minnesota NCAA hockey teams compete in are going to be done for the year. And we'll have a few more roundtables coming out here in the next couple months. Excellent. Of course, Judd's Buds, Fellowship of the Ranks, uh, you name it. Soda Pod has it, including my wonderful face on Mondays. We'll be uh, taking a look at the NHL playoffs coming up uh, next week. So excited for that. Isha, Jewel Erickson Eck had himself his first career 30 goal season, 64 points in 76 games, heading into the finale against the Kraken. And 
like clockwork, we talk about this every season with Eric Sinek. Career high in goals. Four off of his career high in assists. A career high in points. A career high in plus minus. Career high in penalty runners. Uh, tied a career high in power play goals. Played a career high in minutes. Five game winning goals. Shot 11.3%, which is one of his better marks of his career. Oh, and he did find a way to improve his faceoff percentage to 49.8 while also taking a career high in faceoff attempts. And he so, still has never played 82 freaking games. Imagine I, if this guy plays a full season. It's crazy. It's, it's incredible. Like you, you talk 78 about. 78 was his most. Or was the and, most 77 and then yeah, 76 here. And the the athletic did their like what went wrong for the Minnesota Wild, which kind of gave me the creative juices to spin this into what went right. Yeah. Um it was mostly injuries, I imagine. Uh, injuries, goaltending, and questions about the center position heading into the season, which were definitely warranted because yeah. you had Eck, didn't know what you were gonna get from Marco Rossi. They still had Ryan Hartman and Freddie Goudreau and Connor Dewar kind of penciled in as the main centers for this team. It's funny how um, that's been answered now. They they know right. they know what they got going into next year. That has become it's crazy because it seems like the center position has always been a question mark for this team. And now all of a sudden you've got Jewel Erickson Eck with a career year. Um, we didn't have any questions about him because we know what he's been able to supply defensively. But Eric Sinek leading the charge with Marco Rossi, with Murat Huznadinov, and that's not even taking into account some of the other players in the system that are going to also potentially be able to throw their weight at the center position, such as Vladislav Firstoff, um, Rasmus Kumpalainen. Like, there are still names in the system that can even factor into this, too. And so I think I'm confident in saying that the Wild have for the first time in the last few years, it seems like they finally got the center position steered in the right direction this season with the opportunity to add even more to it going forward. Yeah. No, it's it's super exciting. Like we talked about in the last segment, man. Like it's and it's just crazy to think that it's that was a that was a box that needed to be checked going into the season. It wasn't now, especially with you know Marat coming over now and being here. He is part of this team. That was huge as well. Like it, it was crazy to see just the transition of this team all year due to sometimes having to throw some band aids on and then seeing oh we actually we actually have something here with you know Rossi being elevated in a role. Oh he, okay, he's the real deal. Oh, we got this Russian coming over here for the end of the year. Okay, he he can actually play. You know what I mean? Uh, Chisholm, we got him for free. Oh, look, he actually is going the power play. And Brock Faber, holy crap, this guy is one of the best defensemen in the league. So, like, it definitely, they definitely, it, it seems like they started the season with more patch jobs than now, or with more holes that they've actually filled now towards the end of the year. So, that is, you know, to come full circle, that is a, that is a big positive. Yeah. A lot of questions were answered. Uh, there were definitely a lot of questions that were answered. There are still a lot of questions that need to be answered, but um, it, well, it just begs. It, it just shows that like those contracts that were signed early were uh, maybe panics, not the right word, but kind of overcompensating too many band-aids. Like, okay, well if everything, it was almost like they didn't have enough confidence in themselves. It was like, okay, well, yeah. If Rossi doesn't pan out, if this doesn't work, if this doesn't work, then, well, at least we signed all these veterans and we can maybe still compete instead of, you know what, we're going to push some of the chips in the middle. And we're going to take a chance. Yeah, and I, I still am of the belief, I still am of the belief the Goudreau contract in particular was due to not being sure if Rossi was going to take a step forward. And now that he has, and now that John Hines got here and is like, what, 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 was, what was Dean doing with him? Like he was playing, he was playing second line center with Dean. And now Rossi has that spot. And if Jewel Erickson gets hurt, Rossi can take that spot. It, it just, it seems like 
the center position has led to a lot of other spots on the roster kind of sorting themselves out. We'll see more of that next season with how the bottom six is structured because you've pretty much got your top six locked in with the exception of that wing spot. So we'll see who gets that. But all in all, like there were, there are a lot of reasons to point to as to why the Minnesota wild didn't make the postseason. but these are the kinds of things that GMs need to do in evaluating what worked and what didn't. So you can build around it going forward. And for all the bad penalty kill, for all the uneven goaltending, for all of the um, all the players that missed time, and all the players that were asked to fill the spots that were empty, you've got some guys that show that they're definitely capable of handling roles, and hopefully a couple of guys we saw at the end of the season here that are capable of uh, much more as well. So positives to pull because. The- <laughs> It's been a long season. There, uh, there have been no shortage of things that uh, that I have particularly dove deep on, cut the vein open on. Um, and so let's start. Let's start with the good stuff before we dive in and start to uh, to clean up the mess. Like that's that's what we all do. Is if you're if you're trying to clean up a huge spill or something, you try to make it fun initially before the real work begins. So that's. That those are a few. If you have more that we missed, make sure to comment on today's episode and uh, drop us some of the things that you saw as positives for this season. We could also throw in getting a chance to see Jesper um, in a few games down the stretch. That's another positive for this hey, season. I got a positive. Winnipeg's playing the Avs, and we get to watch the Avs <laughs> suffer. <laughs> we get to watch That's the Central one. Division beat themselves to a pulp. We get to see, uh, yeah, we see Boston destroy Toronto. That's going to be fun. Postseason hockey is here this weekend. I can't wait. You're going to have to get a, you're going to have to get a moving company to peel me away from my TV this weekend. Hey, a couple Minnesota boys or a few Minnesota boys on Washington stamped their ticket to the playoffs as well. So that's exciting. Big shout out to Charlie Lindgren for taking over as uh, number one goalie for the Washington Capitals down the stretch and wheeling them into a postseason spot. And, and TJ Oshie, who's you're still skating, bud. So we're still rooting for you. Yeah, as long as long as he draws breath, he will be uh, a member of that Washington Capitals team. So it should be fun, and uh, we'll probably talk about the uh, playoffs a little bit when uh, when you stop by again uh, next, Isha. So. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, thanks to the listeners for joining us for today's episode. Today's second episode, we'll have a preview of the uh, final game of the season, some things to look for, and uh, we'll just set you up for uh, what will be the final Locked on Wild postcast of the year as well. Make sure to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platforms and on YouTube if you have not already done so so you don't miss out on any new episodes throughout the week. We've got new episodes for you every Monday through Friday as part of the Locked On Podcast Network.